Welcome back to chapter 26. This is the second part, Symbolism and Art Nouveau. So Gauguin started the idea of symbolism, and it continued on past him. So symbolism is an art movement, but it's also a literary movement. A manifesto was written by the poet Jean Marais in the newspaper Figaro Literature in 1886. Poet Baudelaire was also part of this. This movement is uh, dealing with one of uh, dreams, um, expressed sensations, moods. So the idea is that it's very much uh, subjective. We also have the Nabi, which is a secret organization founded in 1888 by a few uh, Parisian artists, including uh, Vuillard. Nabi is Hebrew for prophet. Members were very interested in, the, in religion and the occult, supernatural uh, phenomena. Here we have Edouard Vuillard, the suitor. He's very much interested in how kind of reality dissolves. If you notice, we have, obviously we can tell that we have these uh, two women here uh, doing everyday activities. This man has poked his head around the corner, but it seems to everything's kind of dissolving. It's like whenever you uh, start closing your eyes and everything starts getting hazy there uh, and all the patterns on the wallpaper are just uh, getting into spots of color. His works tend to look like there's uh, almost these, uh, the figures are almost like ghosts that are floating on the sea of paint. Henry Rousseau's The Dream. So Rousseau was a customs officer for most of his life, decided to uh, start painting after he retired. Very much interested in kind of more the academic style of painting, uh, like in gray. So in this, the dream in 1910, this very much resembles a dream where things don't quite make sense. So we have this nude woman reclining on a couch here, and that doesn't seem to be uh, congruous with the jungle that surrounds her. So in this jungle we have a lot of animals that they seem almost hidden. Uh, we've got a bird up here, we have an elephant over here, another bird, a couple lions, we have a snake down here, and then we actually have a man over here who's uh, playing an instrument uh, that seems to be in the shadows. Uh, we have a couple monkeys, uh, in the trees. So we actually have a lot going on. Now some actually interpret this uh, in a very sexual nature, dealing with the man that's in the shadows, uh, watching her almost like a voyeur, and then the snake, uh, and the phallic nature of the instrument that uh, he's playing. Um, but those are just uh, an interpretation of uh, this piece. Edward Munch's The Scream. So this version of The Scream, and there are actually more than one version. This version, he painted in 1893 after he moved to Berlin. And we have the now famous uh, image of the figure uh, grasping both sides of his head with his hands and uh, opening his mouth like in a scream. Well, there's several different um, possible reasons for painting this. Um, one has been given that in 1883, there was an eruption of the Indonesian volcano Krakatoa. At the time, this was the loudest sound heard by any human. The sound waves traveled 1,500 miles and ashes circled the globe. Europe was then immersed in blood red or blue sunsets for over six months. In Monk's diary, he wrote, I sensed a great infinite scream pass through nature. This is what he wrote during this time. The other possible uh, influence on this piece is that at uh, the time, uh, 1890s, he actually lived uh, near a slaughterhouse and an insane or lunatic asylum. Those are 
a couple of variations or possible um, influences for this piece. So if you uh, subscribe to the Krakatoa one, obviously you see the kind of the blood red sky. Uh, so if that was a, a loud uh, sound, obviously this person is holding their, uh, their hands over their ears, uh, but obviously the pain, agony, uh, even horror uh, could definitely be linked to the slaughterhouse or the asylum. There are four different versions. One that's in the National Gallery of Art in Oslo. It was uh, stolen in 1994 and recovered. Two uh, in uh, the Munch Museum, uh, one of which was stolen in 2004 and recovered in 2006. And then a, uh, another one that's in pastel that's in private hands. Gustav Klimt's The Kiss. So this is actually one of a series that he did. He started this series in 1902. The woman in this piece is his lover. This actually relates to an 1897 painting by Munch, also called The Kiss, right there. So you can see the, the relevance between that piece and this one. Both Munch's and Klimt's were both inspired by a piece by Rodin as well. We have this couple that they seem to be almost melting or melding into one another. It can also be said that one is maybe consuming the other. So there's some also some different interpretations of this piece. Um, some interpret it as uh, a very romantic piece. Ah, they're kissing on a bed of wildflowers. But then some actually see that they are on an edge, on a precipice. So the idea could be that they're about to go over the edge. Uh, now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And why is, is uh, he seeming to kiss her, her cheek, but she's not um, you know, reciprocating? Some also see her hand uh, that's uh, above uh, his neck as uh, possibly like pulling him under or pulling him over. And in those interpretations, she's definitely the femme fatale. Gustav Klimt has this style where he will pair a realistic image of a face and hands, as you can see, where the bodies become these amorphous uh, figures that are filled with almost uh, mosaic tiles. Very much kind of influenced by the Byzantine with all their gold and designs. Uh, some might even see that it's uh, influenced by some Venetian glass works. Um, but definitely it is a much different look uh, for the bodies of the figures versus the, the heads, the faces. In 1897, he was one of the founders of the Vienna Secession, which is an avant-garde arts organization. There was 22 uh, artists who went together to form this, and he was elected the first president of it. Started in Munich, it spread to Berlin, and its uh, focus was showcasing applied arts. This is one that you also might be familiar with. This is the portrait of Adele Blockbauer, uh, this is the one where the uh, focus of uh, the Woman in Gold movie is about, uh, specifically of uh, trying to get this painting returned. And again, that uh, you can watch that movie in for extra credit. Uh, it's one of your extra credit possibilities. In this, we have uh, Adele Blockbauer. Uh, again, you have the face. Uh, the neck and the hands, uh, very beautifully done realistically. Uh, you have her jewelry being uh, detailed. Uh, but then the rest of her body in the background becomes this mosaic of gold and patterns. Henry Asawa Tanner's Angels Appearing Before the Shepherds. He's an African-American artist. Um, he started out as a realist. Uh, under the artist uh, Thomas Aikens in the 1880s. In 1892, he went to Paris. Uh, he was a son of a preacher, and so uh, very familiar with um, uh, the religious stories, and you will see those popping up in a lot of his work. 
So this piece is very much not in that realist style. Um, this is very much more in kind of that symbolist mode. So we have a, an angel or uh, almost uh, just kind of an outline or shape of an angel. Almost seems like the angel is moving uh, mid piece. And then we have these uh, tiny specks of people down here. And even the landscape is very kind of nebulous uh, and hard to detail. But then we also have a figure here, notice. It almost seems to uh, blend into the background. So here's a piece that we have at the Maybe Gear Museum. And you can, it's actually a really small piece, but you can see there's actually a lot more detail in this one uh, than the angels. Um, and this is, he had uh, been traveling with to Cairo. Um, and you can have, well, we still have not a lot of detail in the piece, in the, um, figures here, we still have a lot more detail than we do uh, in this one. Auguste Rodin, The Gates of Hell. These are 17 feet high doors that he designed for a decorative arts museum. The commission actually ended up falling through, but he continued to work on it for years. So this is like uh, Michelangelo and uh, the tomb that uh, he was working on. So this is something that Rodin would just keep going back to and back to uh, for a very long time. So this is inspired by Dante's Inferno from the Divine Comedy. The Thinker, there we have the Thinker right here. Uh, this is uh, representing Dante himself. And the idea that he's thinking up all of this uh, world uh, that happened in uh, the Divine Comedy. It's supposed to be a metaphor for the futility of life. And the inability to fulfill passions was the second circle of hell, if you remember. This actually was never cast during his lifetime. Rodin was rejected by the École de Beaux-Arts. He ended up attending the Petite École, which specialized in decorative arts. The thinker. Again, this comes from uh, the gates, and there's some similarities between Rodin and Michelangelo on his uh, figures, his very muscled figures, and very uh, expressionistic as well. He mostly worked in plaster or terracotta and then cast it in bronze, and he liked to keep this um, rough, uneven uh, surface that you see here. He didn't want it very smooth and finished and, and perfect looking. He liked it more stripped down. We really have, we have these massive hands and feet, and the idea is that this figure is uh, thinking about something and the, the weight of this is really getting to him. You can see that in the shoulders and the whole body length. This whole uh, figure suggests uh, inertia and indecision. The walking man. So he liked to do things like this where he would strip away kind of uh, the unessentials and really just kind of focus in on uh, some, some parts, some specifics. This began in 1877 as a preliminary study for a figure of St. John. And he thought that if he removed distractions such as a face or uh, anything else that might be associated with that figure, that then you really get to focus on the figure itself. This one, you're really focusing on the movement, on the fact that he's walking, on how does that affect the figure? How does the weight and the muscles, how does all of this work? If you're not focusing on that head and the arms and all these other parts, if you're just looking at, and if you notice, the torso is even uh, rougher than the legs. The legs are the most finished, the more smooth. That's what he's wanting you to focus in on, is the legs and therefore their action of walking. He first cast this in bronze in 1888. This specific cast you're looking at was 1903. The Burgers of Calais. Uh, so Burgers of Calais, uh, Burgers means uh, bourgeois or bourgeoisie. This was a monument that was commissioned 
uh, by the city of Calais to commemorate six citizens who had agreed to sacrifice themselves during the 1347 English siege of Calais during the Hundred Years' War. In exchange for the execution of six of these uh, burghers, and so again, burghers, that this is a... Um, they're kind of like the city leaders. The English agreed to lift the siege and spare the town. So these are the volunteers. They have agreed to die to save their town. When he presented this to the city of Calais, they were horrified. They hated this. They were thinking of something very nationalistic, very... Um, uh, that these men would be striding off like you would see, uh, like David would do, like uh, striding off to war, uh, very strong, powerful men that were, uh, you know, happy to give their lives for their city. Um, but what Rodin does is he's really focusing on human nature. And what would these men really be like? These men who know that they are about to die in a few moments. That's what he's looking at. And you can see that they, all these men are dealing with it differently, which are also very much like human nature. So we have, we have the stoic over here. He's just stoically uh, going to... Uh, to his death. We have the man over here who's holding his his head in his hands and he just can't he can't take it. This is just too much. And and you can see how each of these men are dealing with this uh this horror in their own way. Each are alone with their own thoughts confronting death. They are in burlap sacks with these ropes tied around their waist. And they are trudging off to their death, not marching triumphantly. So originally, this was supposed to be a monument to sit on the ground in the plaza outside the city hall. And it was supposed to look like the figures were walking from the building. However, the, the town council, uh, again, they were just horrified at this. So they uh, put it on a very high pedestal in this uh, remote area so that no one would see it because they were uh, very embarrassed by all of this. But really, it's a brilliant depiction of human nature. And, and, you know, if you are depicting six people who are about to die, who know they're about to die, how does that happen? Art Nouveau. In 1895, the German entrepreneur Siegfried Bing opened a decorative shop called La Maison de l'Art. Nouveau, or the House of New Art in Paris. They originally started uh, importing Japanese uh, furniture, um, very much uh, in the Japanese uh, style of art that they uh, featured. Then he started hiring um, well-known architects and artists to design uh, these rooms for his shop and design furniture and vases and tile and stained glass. The style became known as uh, Art Nouveau, New Art, uh, based on his uh, shop, again, House of New Art. It's also sometimes called uh, Jungenstil uh, in Germany, it means youth, or secession style in Vienna. So one of the things about Art Nouveau is that it is um, handcrafted. It has the idea of, again, all aspects are being uh, created. So in this room, in a room, uh, an artist is going to be working on the ceiling and the walls and um, the furniture and um, the hardware and every aspect goes together to create a unified feeling. Lewis Comfort Tiffany, a wooded landscape in three panels. So most of you are familiar with the name Tiffany. Uh, you might be well known with uh, the uh, windows and uh, the lampshades uh, you probably have seen. So one thing about Tiffany's works is they tend to be very organic. They have lots of vines and flowers and trees very much dealing with uh, organic nature, uh, but it's got a very abstracted feel, uh, not necessarily uh, true to life. Victor Horta, 
This is the stairwell of the Tassel House in Brussels. So again, all aspects. So we have uh, the tile on the floor. We have the railing going up. We have the supports for the grand staircase here. We have the light fixtures. We have the door. Every element, the wallpaper, the painting on the wall, uh, whichever it is, every element goes together. So we have this tendril-like, vine-like feel to all of this. Even if it's not necessarily portrayed as a vine per se, it's kind of very much vine-like as it's swirling uh, all over the wall and again on these different elements. So one thing you're going to notice is that Art Nouveau is slightly different in different places. So we're talking about Brussels and Belgium. Again, Horta is designing uh, this whole area. So he's designing the stairwell, the columns, the railings, everything. So it all works together all moves together as one unit. Also we have sunlight coming in from a glass ceiling, again bringing in nature, these natural organic elements. Hector Gomard, Metro Station Paris. So Art Nouveau started out in Brussels and then moved to Paris and as you can see this is just a, a Metro Station uh, entrance but yet we still have this uh, Art Nouveau influence. So in this case we almost have this animal-like or zoomorphic feel to it because these two light fixtures almost look like glowing red eyes and the opening here is like the giant maw or mouth of a uh, figure almost like those uh, hell mouths if you remember at the end of the Gothic age. So you have this kind of figure uh, or uh, almost animal that's uh, about to eat you or you're about to uh, crawl into its mouth. And you really have, uh, again, this organic, natural element uh, throughout all of this. Uh, it's encouraged by, um, again, this kind of greenish color of paint, kind of a grayish green. Um, we've got these again tendrils kind of uh, swirling up uh, the metal railings. Next, Barcelona. Antoni Gaudi, Casa Mila. This is a apartment building. It's quite unique. So we had seen undulating lines in buildings earlier, right? We've seen that in some of the cathedrals and other buildings, but we've never seen it quite so natural. The idea here is to make it look like the beach. So we have this tan color, like the beach, the wrought iron railings on the balconies are meant to look like seaweed that has uh, been washed up onto the shore. And then we have the chimneys that look like sand castles there at the top of the building. The undulating lines um, actually make its way inside as well. Uh, again, that's uh, the outside. There is close up of some of the chimneys. And there is a floor plan of the inside. There is not a straight wall anywhere in the building. It is all curved line. So he really wanted to look at the elements of, uh, he took nature. Uh, he also took elements of Spanish Baroque, uh, the Moorish Mosque of Southern Spain. He took elements from all these different areas and incorporated them into his buildings. All right, I thought you might be uh, interested in seeing a few other of his buildings. Again, uh, his buildings very rarely have straight lines. This one um, almost looks like candy, the way it's uh, all the colors are fantastically. It almost looks like a dragon with the scales up here. Um, and again, you have this almost uh, zoomorphic uh, or uh, almost looks like animal faces in the uh, balconies and then the interior if you notice again no straight lines we've got everything's curved 
Um, so I've, I've read uh, the accounts of many people who've uh, lived in these buildings and said that while they're beautiful, you can never hang anything ever on your walls. You can never put a bookcase against a wall. Um, this is this is a hallway. Instead of having, you know, it's straight across, it's almost an egg shape. Um, so again, a very natural element. And this is uh, La Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. Now, Gotti was a huge supporter of Catalan nationalism, and Barcelona is uh, the capital of Catalonia. Um, occasionally, it keeps popping up in the news that they still want to try to separate uh, from Spain, but they have uh, yet to do so. So Gotti started uh, La Sagrada in 1883, and it is still not finished. He died in 1926 at the age of 73 in a trolley accident. Uh, it was only a quarter of the way complete at the time. Um, by that point in time, he was uh, living and working uh, entirely uh, there at La Sagrada um, and pouring everything he had into it. And so when he was hit by this trolley, he looked like a homeless man because of the state of his clothing and visage and so no one would help him and so he actually lay dying on the sidewalk for a while you might uh, remember a few years ago there was a fire in the western section in may 2014 um, they are hoping to have that uh, the entire building finished by 2026 is the last i read uh, and at which point it will be the tallest religious building in Europe. Now we go to Scotland. Don't worry, I won't try the Scottish accent. Charles René Mackintosh. All right, so one thing I really want to point out is the difference between Art Nouveau in Scotland and anywhere else. So it might be hard to tell between Brussels and Paris and Barcelona that you, you can see some differences, but there should be some huge differences between Scotland and the rest of Europe. And a lot of that has to do with Scotland itself. The nature is different. Uh, the temperature and um, the environment is just a, a different uh, monster there. And so we're still talking Art Nouveau, but it's going to look a lot different. Charles René Mackintosh. This is the north facade of the Glasgow School of Art. As I said, he is Scottish, and uh, we've got very much a Scottish uh, feel of the building. Uh, we tend to have this heavy stone. We do have a lot of windows letting in the natural light, and it's really the details. Uh, like right here, we have this kind of almost Celtic knotwork in uh, these supports. Um, it's going to be the details, really. Uh, but we're going to have a lot more um, geometric designs, a lot more angles. So you never saw a straight line in Gaudi. You never saw, um, you know, even a, a full circle. I mean, you, you're, you're seeing everything very, uh, very organic with Gaudi. Macintosh is going to be the opposite. All right, there's a close-up of what I was talking to you about. Almost kind of Celtic knotwork here. Um, again, it's uh, the design work in like the windows. So we do have some, a lot of these great details here. And this is uh, the library in that uh, beautiful dark wood. Again, it's dark. Um, Scotland has a lot of uh, rainy overcast days. It's a very dark. Uh, and so he's uh, playing that up. And then we've got uh, these wonderful light fixtures here. Again, it's the details that you really need to look at. Unfortunately, there has been a lot of tragedy as well. There was a fire in May 2014. And this was a working art school. Uh, it was started by a student's uh, project. It had to do with a uh, projector and getting too hot and starting a fire. And then we had another fire in June 2018. And that's what these photos are from. 
the June 2018 was actually worse um, and it actually destroyed all that had been rebuilt after the 2014 fire. There you can see uh, those are the same uh, window supports. Uh, this is actually in the, the library. Uh, so all that wood uh, just went up. Um, this was a highly destructive fire and it's just um, the building itself really was just gutted. Here's another uh, Macintosh uh, room. This is the Salon Deluxe Willow Tea Rooms, Sashi Hall Street, Glasgow. All right, so again, we have geometric elements. So we have uh, these um, right angles here. We have this grid-like design here. In fact, if you notice, we have a grid on those windows. He loves utilizing the grid. So he does like squares and rectangles and things. But then we have his rose, these Celtic knotwork roses. And so we have these throughout. Um, and it's my personal opinion that he's very influenced by um, the, the Celtic uh, imagery, uh, the history surrounding him. Um, and he uh, definitely uses that in these roses that he likes to use. Again, you have these natural elements, uh, but they're also kind of mimicked with these uh, hard uh, angled chairs. Now again, he designed all of this. He designed uh, the walls. He designed the doors and the, the doorknobs and the chairs and the tables. Every element he designed as one. Here are uh, some different ones. Again, different chairs, but again, we have a straight back. We have uh, kind of grid designs. Um, again, we have those Celtic knotwork roses. 